Good morning and welcome to Orchard Community Church. We're so glad that you're here today. It's a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So if you would uh, pray with me as we open our service. Heavenly Father, we start off our prayer this morning uh, for Pastor Matt and uh, our hearts are with him. Uh, we know that he's not feeling well and we know it must be pretty bad for him to uh, not be here with us this morning. So we lift him up to you, Father. Uh, bring him a fast a recovery of fast healing and bring us safe bring him safely back to us and bless our hearts with your love and we just love you in jesus name we pray amen if you would please stand as we begin in song
please be seated. Uh, you can find a digital bulletin for the service in the YouVersion Bible app. There's also a link in the chat section of this stream and our weekly email in that bulletin as well as on our website and Facebook page. You can find information on our ministries and events. Be sure to fill out the connection card, prayer request card that you received with your bulletin when you came in. This is exciting. The Orchard Christmas Tree Lighting is coming up on November 27th. Are you all going? I'll be there. I'll be there. Uh, it's also, it also happens to be the first Sunday of Advent, um, making it the beginning of the Christmas season. There will be food, activities, music, lots and lots of fun. Uh, the tree lighting is at 630. Um, let's see, music from 5 to 7. So come around 5 o'clock, anytime after 5. And then the actual tree lighting is at, we always get mixed up on the, what's the official, the official start time is 5 o'clock, but we, for the actual tree lighting to turn on the lights is at 6.30, the thing, that part of it. So uh, there's also a congregational meeting on uh, November 6th to elect our elders and deacons. Their names are printed in your bulletin. Uh, there is a new members class in November. It's on the 2nd, 9th, and 16th of November. Uh, RSVP to the church office if you'd like to uh, be a part of that new members class. And then this evening, early evening, late afternoon, we're having our fall festival trunk or treat. And we'd love to have you join us. Our bluegrass band is going to be playing there, so you get to hear some hillbilly music. And uh, I love the kids' parade when they, they say, this is Billy, and uh, he's dressed as a hobo, and uh, his favorite things are Legos and playing in his backyard. And, uh, but anyway, it's a whole lot of fun. So if you get a chance to come out and see that, it's really a great uh, community event for our church. So, Good morning. Now, I know some of you are going to be dressing up and wearing a costume today and maybe even tomorrow, too. Isn't it fun to dress up and wear a costume and pretend to be something else? Shout out what you're going to dress up as and tell us, what are you going to be? What's your costume? Oh, the Grinch? That's the best. Oh, my goodness. All right. You have some fun ideas. But at the end of the night, when you take off your costume, I want you to look in the mirror and go, wow. Everybody say that. Wow. Because God made you amazing just the way that you are. All right? So have fun dressing up in your costumes. And then what are you going to say when you take your costume off and you look in the mirror? Wow. All right, boys and girls, we're going to go with our teachers today. So I get to lead us in prayer this morning. Um, so if you'll join me. Father God, thank you for loving us, for sending us your son, Jesus, for filling us with the Holy Spirit so that we can love you, for including us and following through on your plan since the beginning of time. We want to know you. We want to know your love. We want to be filled with your love so much that it affects who we are and how we behave. And so it shines through us to light the world of our friends, neighbors, and colleagues. We want to know you. These are turbulent, unsteady times. We want to know your presence. Help us to remember who you are, Lord, creator, and sustainer of everything we know. I ask that your love and spirit would guide our thinking, attitudes, discussions, even our decisions about voting. You would hold our country in your hand and that we would act according to your love and the hope that we have in you. Lord, don't give fear a place in our lives, but keep our eyes on you. Hear us now as we silently confess our distractions, sins, and failures to keep you as our one and only God. We remember and ask for your mercy towards the people that are hurting. Our friends and family close to us suffering from health, emotional, or financial distress and people throughout the world that are hungry, sick, caught up in war, affected by changing climate, 
are surrounded by corruption that need your help. Hear us as we call aloud and give voice to our concerns. Father, accept our worship here today as we present ourselves as living sacrifices to you. Fill us anew with your spirit and send us out from this place in your power to live that abundant life that you promised. Change us and through us change this, your world. We love you forever and ever. Amen. We also get to worship God by sharing our tithes and offerings, and so it's a chance to support the ministries of this church and the ministries supported by this church. So if the ushers would come forward, and then remember to turn in your attendance roster too. Thank you.
Everybody shout out Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. As always, it is so good to be back home. And uh, it's really nice to see um, some wonderful old faces. And, and I do mean old. You, you <laughs> <laughs> some, you're welcome. Um, some of you have really been aging since I've been gone. Um, <laughs> Uh, this place is so full of um, really good memories. Um, when we were singing that um, uh, song, Be Thou My Vision, um, there's a line in there which uh, says uh, that uh, I'm thy true son. And every time I sing that anywhere, I remember uh, my wife standing beside me singing and she would sing it, I'm your true daughter. Um, doesn't quite fit the meter of the song, but it, uh, um, good times. And uh, we're going to be looking at what your bulletin says are some sticky questions about Jesus. And uh, just kind of before we jump into that, uh, have you ever been disappointed 
by a restaurant or a book or a movie or something that didn't quite live up to its hype. Uh, you'd been really looking forward to this great thing that you'd heard about, and it was uh, kind of meh. Um, okay, we, we've all had that experience. Which basically says, if you're going to make a big promise, you'd better deliver big, right? Well, the Gospel of Mark is the shortest of the four Gospels that tell us the life of Jesus, and it starts out with an absolute blockbuster of a promise in the first verse. Um, let's, uh, I told David I'd give him a cue. That was the cue. There it is. <coughs> My cues are a little subtle sometimes. Okay. Mark starts out his book saying that his book is the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. So he's promising good news, number one, and he's saying that Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ, the one promised throughout uh, Scripture, and that he was the Son of God. And then Mark sets about from here proving his case, and he does it in rapid fire, hitting us with a whole string of evidences that what he's talking about is good news for us, that Jesus really is the one who is promised in Scripture, and that he is absolutely the Son of God. You want to see how he did it? Okay, well, uh, if you've got a Bible with you, I brought mine, I don't, I don't know what the rest, or your phone, whatever you're, you're working there, you can read through the first chapter of Mark, and he starts out talking about John the Baptist uh, as predicted in Scripture as the one who would prepare the way for the Lord, and John the Baptist makes the announcement that someone after is coming after him who's greater than him. And then we get the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and we're told that he goes out teaching, and he is sharing good news with people. And then we see Jesus um, recruiting his first four disciples, four fishermen, uh, Simon, Andrew, James, John, uh, gets these people to follow him, and then there's a whole string of miraculous healings that Jesus does. And some of them are mentioned specifically, and some of them are just, we're told that he's healing lots of people. And by the time you get to the end of the chapter, uh, Jesus has become so popular that he doesn't dare go into any of the towns or villages because he's just mobbed by the crowds. So he's staying out in very remote areas. So the beginning of the story of Jesus goes like gangbusters. I mean, this is a really great introduction, a great beginning, a great start. Everything is going along marvelously. Turn the page into chapter 2. And now Mark continues kind of in the same vein, except He's going to give us five incidents in the life of Jesus, right one after the other, in which people raised questions. It always happens when somebody does something out of the ordinary or unusual or whatever, people start asking questions about it, right? We're curious. We want to know, you know, is this the real deal? And the questions that people were asking, some of them were objecting, some of them were just curious, but they were wanting to find out who is this man? Is he really the guy that Mark promised back in that first verse? Is he really Messiah? Is he really bringing good news? Is he really the Son of God, or is he a fake? Or is he just a good moral teacher? Is he some kind of a prophet? Who is he? What's he about? Why did he come? Ready? Um, Let's look at these five incidents. And the first one is a very familiar story, and it's kind of a humorous one. It's told in three of the four Gospels, although Matthew, for some reason, doesn't tell us the story, the part about letting the paralyzed guy 
through, down through the hole in the roof, which whenever I've told this story to kids, that's the best part of the story to them. Um, man, wouldn't that be cool? Um, not if it's your house, but... <laughs> so this paralyzed guy is, is brought, dropped through the hole in the roof, and Jesus then says the most remarkable thing. He says to him, son, your sins are forgiven. And if it was stunning to everybody because that wasn't the reason that the, his friends had brought him to see Jesus. They wanted him to be healed of his paralysis. But Jesus always cut to this core of an issue. And when he said this, he stunned everybody and he raised all kinds of questions in the minds of some of the teachers of the law who had come to check him out. And their reaction silently was, wait, who can forgive sins except God? Uh, in fact, uh, that's, I, I, I meant to give you my second cue for the next uh, verse, which, uh, how are we doing? Uh, okay. And Mark tells us some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, Jesus knew what they were thinking, and so he asks them a question in re response, and he says, okay, which would be easier for me to say to this fellow down here, um, your sins are forgiven, or get up and walk? Now, obviously, he had just said your sins are forgiven, but how could anybody see whether that actually happened or not? Um, the uh, teachers of the law obviously didn't believe it had happened. So Jesus then says, okay, just so that you will know that I have the authority and the power and the right to forgive sins, get up and walk. And the guy got up and walked and went home. And that incident tells us one of the purposes why Jesus came was to bring us God's forgiveness. There are lots of things we think we need from God and we would like from God. That man really wanted healing of his paralysis. He ended up getting that, but what he needed most and what we have all needed most is God's forgiveness. That, folks, is really good news as to why Jesus came. That's something to hang on to. That's a hard thing for a lot of us. Sometimes, even though we have heard that, kind of given assent to it, it's still kind of, we have a hard time with the idea that God really has forgiven me for that rotten thing I did. Um, and we often have problems with other people who we have been told we should forgive just as God has forgiven us. And man, there are some people in my life who are just hard to forgive. But that's one of the reasons God came, sent Jesus. And Mark starts with that. So while you noodle on that a little bit, uh, Mark, um, all the way through his gospel, Mark keeps moving along in a hurried pace. He moves on to the next episode, which in is Jesus encountering a tax collector, a fellow named Levi, also known as Matthew. And uh, Jesus tells him to uh, come and follow him. And Ma Levi gets up and leaves his uh, tax business. And that evening, he hosts a big party for Jesus and his disciples and a whole bunch of his friends, other tax collectors, and most translations call also say the crowd was a bunch of sinners. Uh, J.B. Phillips' translation just lumps them all together as disreputable people. And, um, and you probably know that tax collectors in that society were really, really, really looked down on. They were hated and despised because they were working for the hated Roman government, and they were dishonest. They kept cheating people. Um, and uh, so the question came up, 
Why does Jesus eat with those people? And Jesus' answer, uh, oh wait, I meant to give you another cue there. Um, next question. Uh, oh, there, oh, you got it there. <laughs> um, when the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and the tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with sinners and tax collectors? And Jesus gave this answer. He says, people who are healthy don't need a doctor, just people who are sick. He says, I came, I came to call the sinners. I came to reach the disreputable people. I came to bring God's forgiveness that Mark had talked about in the first episode. I came to bring God's forgiveness not just to the nice, respectable church folks, but to the outsiders, the disreputable folks, the folks that maybe the nice people don't feel comfortable hanging out with. And boy, is that also good news. Because it means we didn't have to achieve a certain standard of respectability in order to earn God's forgiveness. It means Jesus came to forgive us while we were yet sinners. Hang on to that one for a minute. Because the third episode, uh, Mark gets into a real quickly. It's a little bit esoteric, uh, and it has to do with the practice of fasting. There were some people who came to Jesus, and they wanted to know, why is it that the disciples, uh, oh wait, I'm, yeah, um, you're right on with those things. Um, now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. That, that means going without food as a religious observance, uh, to kind of focus all of your uh, corpuscles on, on something spiritual, okay? And uh, it was a discipline. And some people came and asked Jesus, and one of the other gospels in telling this story says that these were the, some of the disciples of John who came to ask this. And they said, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Now, um, Jesus gives two answers. Uh, the first one was kind of just a quick answer to the direct question, the specific question. And he uses, as he often did, a little illustration. He says, well, if there's a big uh, um, wedding feast going on, the friends of the bridegroom aren't going to fast while the celebration is going on and the bridegroom is there. Now, Jesus was likening himself to the groom in this illustration. Just want to make sure you're all catching on. I, it seems obvious that the, the people who were there at the moment got the point real quickly. I'm never quite sure with this crowd, so I'm... <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so, and Jesus says, but when the bridegroom is gone, then they can fast. Okay, took care of that issue and that question. But then Jesus expanded the thing significantly by saying something that at first sounds totally unrelated. He says, no one takes a piece of unshrunken cloth and sews it onto an old garment. And no one takes... Um, new wine and puts it into an old wineskin. Now, I'm not really up on the, uh, what happens with wine and, and uh, you know, it, as it ages. Um, I could ask a chemistry teacher, you know, to maybe uh, explain that. But uh, when I was a kid in elementary school up in Northern California near Santa Cruz, all of us boys wore blue jeans, long-legged blue jeans. Somehow, the way Levi Strauss made the things, it didn't take very long before the knees gave out. And this was way before it became cool to wear ripped jeans. I mean, you know, 
<clears throat> you didn't go out and buy jeans that had already been torn to shreds. You know, the, and my mother, being the very fastidious woman that she was, um, wanted to make sure that I wasn't going around with my knees sticking out. So um, she bought patches. And she taught me how to sew them on, um, more or less. And I noticed that one of the patches said on, on a little piece of paper on, on, that was stapled onto them. The hardest part of the whole job was getting that dang staple out of the, the, the patches. But uh, it said it, they were pre-shrunk. And I asked my mom, what is, what's that? Well, uh, by that time, I had figured out that when you got a new pair of jeans, it took several rounds through the laundry before they shrunk down to fit you. Um, Nobody, they could pre-shrink the lousy patches, but they wouldn't pre-shrink the jeans yet. <laughs> um, but so if you had a pair of old jeans and you took a, an unshrunk patch and sewed it on there, sooner or later it's going to rip apart. Okay, everybody got the picture. Now, Jesus wasn't trying to teach anybody about good laundry practices. What he was saying was, and having just referred to himself as the bridegroom at a celebration, he was saying he had come to do something new in this world. He was not just coming to tweak the old ways of doing things, the old ways of believing, the old ways of living, but he was coming to do something brand new and that's something, we sang about it, about how God has, Jesus has given us new life. And we sometimes, particularly those of us who've been around for a, a while uh, in the church, we kind of take it for granted maybe, but uh, Jesus Christ in our life does something different from the world's way of doing stuff. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans and he says, don't let the world make you conform to its mold, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so sometimes we forget that what God wants to do in our lives is to make us different, better. Jesus said he came to give us life abundantly. And sometimes we kind of look around and say, well, my life is kind of same old, same old. I'm not, where's all this abundant stuff? Maybe we need to go back to some basics in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And while you're thinking about that one, Mark moves on to the fourth episode which uh, involves another ancient practice, which was the observance of the Sabbath, that Jesus and his disciples were walking along, and uh, the Pharisees said to them, look, why are, you, why are they, Jesus' disciples, doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? You notice I caught the, the cue right there on the fly. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're getting in sync here. Um, and what Jesus' disciples were doing was as they walked along the path, they were pulling off stalks of grain and eating it. And uh, that was perfectly legal to do that because under Jewish law, a farmer um, could not uh, reap all the way up to the edge of his property, but he had to leave a certain amount along there for travelers, strangers, passers-by, um, lazy, hungry people who wanted to... Um, help themselves to something um, real close to the path. So that wasn't the problem, but it was the, the disciples were doing this on the Sabbath, the day when no work was supposed to be done. And Jesus responded to this question by saying, first of all, he told an incident from the life of David, the greatest king in Israel, who had done something far more drastic than just grab a few pieces of a... a Grain, but then that led him into saying, it's important for you to know that the Sabbath was made for people, not people 
made for the Sabbath. That's a huge distinction that the Sabbath regulations, a day of rest, a day of worship, was made for our benefit, not the other way around. God didn't, you know, when he created people, didn't say, oh, by the way, folks, I've got this Sabbath day once a week where, um, you know, I'm expecting you to follow all these rules here because that's really important to me. And um, uh, no, he has provided both with the idea of a day of rest as well as all of the other regulations, guidelines, commandments, instructions that we've got in this book were given for our benefit, not as challenges for us to try to live up to, that can be so hard for us to understand God as a loving Father who is providing for our well-being rather than being a giant spoil sport in the sky who's trying to end our fun. And while you think on that one, we've come to the end of chapter two. Now, that's kind of unfortunate in a way. Uh, back in the 12th century, there was a fellow who put the chapter divisions into the Bible, did it in a Latin Bible. It was the only one around that he had. And uh, just to make it easier for, to find things, some of the chapter divisions are a little unfortunate, and I think this is one of them, because if I had been there looking over his shoulder, I said, don't end it here. The next episode really belongs with these four. But I wasn't there. So you've got to look at chapter 3, and the first six verses tell us an incident again on the Sabbath, but this time it's a little different than the others. The others were questions and uh, uh, things that arose from out of the things Jesus was doing or saying. This one was a setup. And uh, we're told that on the Sabbath in the synagogue, some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he could heal him on the Sabbath. The him is a fellow who was there at, in the synagogue who had a shriveled, withered hand. And so Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. And then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. And the next sentence on, in there is the one time in the New Testament where we're told about Jesus getting mad. Because he knew, oh, well, this question that he asked was not a hypothetical or a theoretical or philosophical question about is it better to do this or that? Because he knew what those guys were plotting already. And the, the final verse of this episode, verse 6, tells us that after the, they were done in the synagogue, these people who had set up this little incident went out and began plotting how they were going to kill him. So Jesus was having them compare healing this man with a useless hand compared with the evil they were plotting to have him killed. They remained silent, and the next verse tells us Jesus healed the guy. And they went out and began their plot. And Mark included this little incident to make it very, very clear that of all those other things that Jesus said is his purpose, he came to bring forgiveness. He came for all people, even the disreputable folks. He came, what was the point about the fasting? Um, it's in my notes. Um, the, um, is anybody paying attention? Uh, <laughs> Okay, um, all of those good things Jesus said that he came to, or Mark said that Jesus said he came to do, were all leading up to our call to do good in this world. That 
We aren't called just to worship God, just to enjoy the good celebration, the good things he's done, the new life that he has provided. We're called to be Christ's people and to live and to share and to love as he did. That when we finish our Sabbath gathering, are we uh, likely to go out well, I don't think anybody's plotting on going out and murdering somebody right after church, but unless they get in your way on the parking lot, and then and it's a whole other. But are we actively thinking as we walk out of here, based on what I've heard, based on what I've sung, based on how we've prayed, is there somebody in my world that I could do good for, that I could show God's love to, that I could care for, that I could be friendly to. Is that on the frontal lobe of our brain as we live our lives seeking to be God's people in this broken world? The book of Hebrews has a little warning in the um, first verse of of the second chapter. For this, I'm going to try to get it right. The writer of the Hebrews says, we must pay the most careful attention to what we have heard. You know, that's not a bad reminder at the end of a sermon. Um, um, Okay. He goes on to say that in paying careful attention to what we have heard, the warning is that we not allow ourselves to drift away. Now, the word that is used there doesn't appear anywhere else in the New Testament for the drift away, but it was commonly used in many other um, ancient Greek uh, literature and writings. And it basically means the idea of allowing something to get lost out of neglect. And that's something that happens to all of us in various areas of our life. We, um, have you ever said, where did I leave my glasses? Or, or where are my keys? Where's the TV remote? Where's my phone? Um, there are things that we, we get busy doing stuff and we let something slide. The writer of the Hebrews is saying, we must take care not to let that happen to our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not a warning to say, don't deny the faith, don't become reprobate, don't go out and rob a bank. It's not warning us against anything. It's saying, pay close attention that you don't let yourself drift to be blown aside that it is so easy for us to take for granted things we have heard a lot. It takes some intentional effort to really hang on to and grow in the purposes that Jesus Christ has for us in bringing us new life, in bringing us wholeness, and love, and forgiveness. And all of that, folks, is the best news any of us could ever hear. Let's pray. Father, you have provided so much good for us. Help us to not let it drift but to be alert and awake and thankful and seeking to grow in the love that you have provided for us. We ask this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. There's a difference between being good and doing good. And I think God has called us to do good. What will it be like? Please stand and sing with us. When my pain is gone And all the worries 
things of this world just fade away what will it be like when you call my name and that moment when i see you face to face i'm waiting my whole life to hear you say well Will it be like when tears are washed away and every broken thing will finally be made whole? What will it be like when I come into your glory, standing in the presence of a love so beautiful? I'm waiting my whole life. crying out, singing holy, holy, holy are you, Lord, singing For over 3,000 years, since at least the time of Moses, God's people have been blessed by these words. May the Lord bless you and take good care of you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.